Thank you, Cindy Rain. Thank you for reading the Word of God. Well, good morning, Northside. Okay, you're awake. I'm good. I'll, I'll accept that. Hey, uh, I just want, can, can I be, can we talk? Can I be real with you? Not that I'm not real, but here's what I'm thinking. I'm sitting right here, and during this worship time, I really felt the presence of the Lord. And I just thank the Lord for our worship team, and I praise the Lord. I really thank the Lord for you as a church family. I really do. My week, I get, I get so busy sometimes. And the thing that I always hold first and foremost is the Lord Jesus Christ, and then his family, and that's you guys. So during the week, oftentimes, you know what I tell myself? Sunday's coming. Yeah, Sunday's coming, and, and I get to be with the family, and I, I get totally rejuvenated. And like I say, every Sunday, you know, when you show up here on a Sunday morning, expect God to do something in your life. Expect God to do something, because he's alive and well, and he loves us, and he's here to do a good thing in our lives. So this morning, we are going to be in um, Philippians once again. And our theme for this morning is learning how to live as servants. Now, that's pretty simple. But learning how to live as a servant under persecution, under trial, under pressure. Because sometimes we don't act like servants when that's in our lives. Our main scripture this morning, Cindy read it so well, is in Philippians 2nd chapter, verses 3 through 18. So if you have your Bible, and I encourage you to bring a Bible. I know you have devices, and that's cool, but I can't hear the pages. So bring a Bible if you got one. Now this morning, we are in the book of Philippians, the second chapter. Last week, we did the first chapter. Four chapters in the book of Philippians. We're going to go through all of them. And um, this morning, we find ourselves once again in, in Philippians. And the, this is a story in chapter number two. This is a story of a faith community, a church. This is about a church learning how to live together in some pretty hard times. And we're going to look at that today. And as we saw last week in the book of Acts chapter 16, you guys remember that? Yes, we were in Philippians chapter 1. But the root of what was really taking place in that church started in the book of Acts. And we saw last week that in the book of Acts chapter 16, we see the roots of that church and it was in a very early stage. Do you remember last week we talked about Paul and Silas, how they went to Philippi? And, and, and we talked about how it was that they were walking the streets, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. And some people were getting converted. And there was some argument over that. And what happened was the magistrate was called in and Saul... Uh, Paul and Silas, they were thrown in prison right there in Philippi. And while they were in prison, they were singing songs and worshiping while they were in the, in the lockdown. And then a miracle happened. Chains fell off their feet and hands and the doors of the cells flew right open. And because of that, the warden of the prison accepted Jesus and not only him, but his whole family. And they all got baptized that was an incredible movement of what was going on in Philippi. So now, time has passed. And it was nearly 10 years have gone by now. And the Apostle Paul, he finds himself once again in prison in Rome. But remember, some time has passed now. And he writes a letter to encourage the church that he had planted a whole decade before. So now he's in Rome writing a letter to this church that we talked about in the first chapter last week. Now think of it. Paul, he's writing this letter inside a prison to encourage other people that are outside of prison. I don't know about you, and, and most guys I know that, you know, when they get thrown in prison, they're usually writing letters to lawyers or family members, hey, get me out of here. But Paul's not doing that. He's writing letters of encouragement to other churches. It's amazing. See, the people of that day, they needed encouragement because persecution was becoming an everyday part of their life. 
in this church in Philippi that Paul had started. So they're being persecuted on a daily basis now. Now, do you remember what I said about uh, Philippi last week? I said that the majority of the citizens there, they were retired Roman soldiers. So that means they survived the battles, they, they lived. And the thing is, their whole allegiance was to Caesar in Philippi. That was their whole allegiance. It was to Caesar. And now Paul comes along, makes, sets up this church, and this church starts to thrive in this little town. And what happens is this. As they start to thrive, more people are starting to come to the Lord. And the Roman soldiers, they don't appreciate that. They think it's being disloyal to Caesar. So that's why this church now in Philippi is being so persecuted on a daily basis. And you know, here's the thing. Not only them, but we, we need encouragement also, don't we? Because the thing is, we live in, in troubled times. Maybe we don't face the kind of persecution that this early church faced or that the church in China or Iraq is facing right now. But as individuals, we certainly have times of testing and times of trials. You know what I'm talking about. You're feeling it. So this letter to the Philippines, to the Philippians, not to the Philippines, but this letter to the Philippians is really interesting. See, God is instructing us about how to live during tough times. This is why this book was put into the Bible. How do we live as a church? How do we live as individuals in tough times? So, truth be told now that honestly, we live in a time of political unrest. And we live in a time of financial instability. We live in a time where there is crime in the streets like we've never seen before. That's just the truth. So how do we deal with this kind of unrest? How do we deal with that? Well, do we watch the Fox News? Do we watch CNN for the answers? People, we need to live our lives as if God is in control. That's how we need to live our lives. As if God is in control. So this letter to the Philippians is God's instruction to us on how to live during these hard times. So we need to pay attention to what's going on in the scripture. So in the book of Philippians, we will learn how to live as if God is in control and also how to live as servants, even when the pressure's on and how to live a life of loss because we will lose things in this life and how to live a life of generous friendship. See, that's why I said, during the week, I may get spent, but Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming because of the generous friendships that I have with you. The love, the, the, the camaraderie that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we worship and exalt him together, that is totally rejuvenating. So today, we turn our attention to chapter 2. So we're going to look at chapter 2, and we discover that Jesus is our model for living in troubled times. You want to know how to live? Take a look at Jesus' life. He lived in troubled times. Now, his model was not only worthy, it is accessible to you and I. It is freely accessible to us. Now, Paul, he challenges us to live up to this example that Jesus set. Paul is saying, there it is. Check out Jesus' life. This is what the standard is that we hold to. That takes us to our first point for the morning. Don't look out for number one. What? I know somebody's probably saying, what, Pastor Ed? What do you mean don't look out for number one? Most of us, all our life, that's all we ever heard. You pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You take care of it. Don't, don't you trust anybody else, you know? You look out for number one. But in accordance with Scripture... Don't look out for number one. Listen, did you know that the phrase God helps those who help themselves, it's not in the Bible? It's not. 
That is not a biblical statement, but yet we hear it all the time, right? You guys have heard that so many times. God helps those who help themselves. It was first written by an English politician, Algeron Sidney, in 1698, in his book, Work Discourse Concerning the Government. Sounds exciting, huh? But he wrote that in the 1600s, but here's the thing. The phrase became popular here in America, culture, after Benjamin Franklin, he used it in the Poor Richard Almanac, which was his writings. So he utilized that saying, and it caught on in America just like that. God helps those who help themselves. And I don't know about you, but I've even heard it, uh, people use it to settle arguments. Well, you shouldn't be doing that because God will help those who help themselves. See, as if it was directly coming from God himself. But it's not. It's not. Listen to what it says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Listen, this is really interesting. Do nothing from selfish or empty con- conceit, but with humility of mind regarding one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. See, we are instructed that in the midst of difficulties that we should not look out for number one. Now, that certainly, it runs against the, the thinking of our time, doesn't it? It really does. And it's easy to be generous when things are just rolling along really good. But Paul, he lays out this challenge in front of people who are actually experiencing persecution, the church of Philippi. And he lays it out in front of them. So the scripture tells us that we should not look after our own well-being, that we should look after the well-being of other people. Very adamant about that. So we learn from the gospel that when Jesus was on the cross, he focused entirely on God's will. That's what drove Jesus. He focused on the Father's will. And he was concerned, and this this blows my mind. He was concerned about the well-being of the people that were persecuting him. The very people that raised the hammer, that put the nail in place and nailed his hand to the cross, he was concerned about them. And, And how do I know that? Well, Jesus, he prayed in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Listen to what Jesus said. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That is an example that we're to learn from. Being on the cross, looking at the people that put him there and said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. You talk about putting other people first. Even before that terrible day on the cross, Jesus, he placed his focus on the Father's will. That's what Jesus did. And was constantly reconciling people back to the Father. That's what he was doing. What an example. In fact, whether in times of persecution or in times of safety or even security, there is no other way to reflect Jesus Christ other than reading his word and emulating his actions. Now think about this. What would happen if our attitude Just as we walk out this door, our attitude changed and we started to be like Jesus in our everyday lives. We started living and acting just like him. At times, we may be influenced by other people that they would say, well, I think you really need to look out for yourself because if you don't, nobody else is going to do that. But here's the thing. Paul is introducing an example of Jesus to the Philippians, and not just to the Philippians, to us here today. See, this, it takes us now to our second point for the morning. And our second point is this. The greatest example of Jesus. The great example of Jesus. So in the next few verses that we're going to read, verses 5 through 11, this is really the core of our scripture this morning. So we're going to really look at this, verses 5 through 11, and we hear one of the greatest songs 
of the early church. This is really interesting because most of the songs that we read about in the Bible was from the Old Testament. Song of Solomon, Psalms, and, and there are many songs that were, were, that were sang by the Israelites. Here, now we see it in the New Testament. Some scholars believe that this passage was actually a worship song sung by the very early followers of Jesus. So it is a song filled with challenges and it has a lot of wisdom in it too. So let's take a look at it. Turn with me now to Philippians, the second chapter, and we're going to be reading verses 5 through 11. And listen how it reads. You could put a beatbox to it or something. But listen to how it reads. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus, as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and he gave him the name above every name, and that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. That's powerful. Now, These six verses that we just read, if you were to break them down into three sentences, it would read like this. First, he made himself nothing. Jesus came and he made himself a mere man. See, we're talking about God, the creator of all things, came to earth, made himself a servant. Second, he humbled himself. And third, after that, God exalted him. If you look at that progression, it's amazing. See, the early hymn is like this step down into humility. The verses that we just read, it's a progression of how we see Jesus coming from heaven to earth. It's an act of humility. See, Jesus is our example. This is the point I've been driving today. Jesus is our example. And we might think that when God came to earth, that He would have demanded that each and every one of us drop to the ground and praise and worship him, and and rightfully so, because he's God, the creator of all things. But no, when God came to earth, he made himself nothing. He, He became like an ordinary man. That's how he came into this world. He humbled himself and living a life as a servant. That's what our Lord and Savior did. And then he humbled himself even unto death. Jesus, he suffered the kind of death in that day and age which was considered shame. This is the death that he suffered. See, this did not happen to Jesus accidentally. This wasn't just an accident or a mishap. See, this is the path that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this is the path that he chose to walk for us. This is the path. So here in Philippians, this ancient worship song, not, it does not leave Jesus in the grave. The scriptures that we read, it talks about his resurrection. So we see that God raised him to life. Indeed, the Father, he raised him high above every other name. High above every other name. And now that's a song totally worth singing. When we hear about this and we we see how the first century church exalted God with these words. But it's more than a worship song. The Apostle Paul, he tells us that Jesus is our example. And Paul, he tells the church in Philippi to have the same attitude The same attitude that Jesus had when he walked this earth. During times of trouble or persecution, we are tempted to defend ourselves, right? Come on now. Somebody says something about your eyebrows, you're like, well, I like them. You know, but we have this tendency built in that we defend ourselves. When people, um, they misunderstand us at work, 
You ever have that problem? You, you, somebody had misunderstand what you had just done, you know, and it, it kind of turns into this push of argument thing. When people, they ridicule us for our beliefs in a public setting. I don't know if you've ever been called out on that. But when our family members, they don't understand our faith and we face temptation then of arguing and fighting. But the Apostle Paul, he says that we should have the same humility of heart and of posture that Jesus Christ had. We should emulate him. Instead, you know, the, the message, it is repeated in many other places in scripture, this message that we're talking about today. And here's just one example. Four different times the Bible says that God gives grace to the humble and, but to the proud, to those who resist him, it doesn't go to them, to the proud. So how different is this in our society? When we take a look at who we are as a society, this kind of goes against the grain, this whole thing that I'm talking about today. I, I thought this was a good quote, and I read it to you this morning. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, Lutheran pastor in World War II, he said, when Christ called a man, he bids him to come and to die. I thought, how harsh is that? What does that mean? But there is no place in our life for bragging rights or in our lives or even in the life of the church. Pride cannot exist if we are going to emulate Christ. So, exaltation is the Father's work. That's what God the Father does. And it requires faith from you and I. And it requires us to trust him that the Father will raise us up in a time and his time and in his way. Regardless of what the situation is that we're facing. If we're walking on this earth as Jesus did, God will uplift us. Point number three, working out our salvation. I don't know about you, but for a long time, I could not figure out what does that mean? Working out myself. I thought when I asked Jesus in my life, it was, it was a done deal. So let's take a look at our third point for the morning. After leading the Philippians in this beautiful worship song that we've just been talking about, the Apostle Paul, he brings a particular word to them about submission. And he brings it to us too. So if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, and let's get a focus now on, on exactly where the Lord is taking us in Philippians. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. For it is God's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. How strange are these words to our ears? If you've been in church for a while, see, we are saved by grace through faith. And, and we understand that because in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that's what it tells us. Yet, the same Apostle Paul who said that we are saved by grace through faith, now he's saying um, that work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so I don't understand, but has Paul changed his mind? Is Paul inconsistent with what he's saying? No, never. He's not. See, what Paul is saying is that we have been given salvation. We have been given salvation. It is a gift. And having received that gift, the only reasonable response to this work towards salvation is to accept the example of Jesus Christ. So working out our salvation is really understanding what that gift was. It was a free gift. And what are we going to do with it? Well, in this lifetime, we are going to spend our life trying to work it out in accordance with the example of Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's working out your salvation. So perhaps It'll take some of the work out of our part because we're, we're following Christ. But the work that we do, it doesn't save us. 
The truth is, is that Jesus, he paid the price for us to go to heaven. And it's through his grace, this gift that was given, that is totally not deserved. You know, grace is a gift that is given that's not deserved. And to trust and obey is the path for Christians to grow. For us as Christians, when we trust and obey, it is the path of our growth. But the path to Christian maturity is the same in good times and bad. In good times and bad, it's the same. So humble yourself because God, he gives grace and he humbles the proud. Because if we're prideful, then we're resisting God. So really, in good times and bad, there is simply no other way to reflect Jesus Christ. Point number four, hold on and hold out. Now, this final passage, we discover that the hard times and the blameless, pure people that are living for Christ in this period of time, they're shiny people. They're people that are very shiny. And, and what I mean by that, we have to look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and through 18. So listen to this. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among the stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice, the service coming from your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you so that you too should be glad and rejoice with me. See, you can tell that the Apostle Paul, he's quite a preacher now. I mean, he really is, because after singing this worship song and everything with everybody, this is what Paul does. He gets very practical. He tells us to do everything without complaining and arguing. And this is true for both the individual and for the community of faith, to set aside complaining and arguing. And here's the thing. Corporate uh, discipleship that is only possible when people realize the blessing of our salvation. We have to totally understand what it is that we've received. And we have been saved by grace. Now, what is there to argue about? And what is there to complain about if we really comprehend that? If there were a community who could live together without all of this arguing, then seriously, they would shine just like the stars. And they would be seen as blameless and pure, even though they would be well aware that God is the one who made them so. God is the one who would make them so. Finally, the Apostle Paul, he tells us to hold on to the word of life. See, this is a wonderful and a challenging command from him. But if we can hold on to God's word of life, the Bible, given to us by the Holy Spirit, then we will be able to hold out our, the word of God to other people, sharing the word with our families and our friends and our community. Now, this would be a demonstration of God's kingdom coming down to earth. Now, the second chapter of Philippians, it puts, in, puts us in touch with the ancient worship of the early Christians and their hearts and what it means to really be a follower of Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote this letter to confront the brothers and sisters in Philippi, he pointed to Jesus as their own example, and he pointed to Jesus for us too. Now, the Lord's example, it does not require us to do miracles or to have this supernatural life, living a life. See, these things are certainly possible. God can do all things through us. But it's not a requirement. You see, it's not a requirement to follow Jesus Christ. No, the heart 
of our faith is to follow the human example of Jesus Christ when Jesus was here on earth. Now, we expect trials and persecution. And when they come, we can't deviate if we are following the example of Jesus. Now, here's the thing. I'd like to review our four points for this morning. The first point we looked at, don't look out for number one. Don't look out for number one. See, and the reason is because Jesus has you. Jesus has you in his hand. He's got you. You don't have to look out for number one. If you're following him, he's got you. Jesus is the greatest example. You see, you remember we were talking about when Jesus was being put on the cross? What was his attitude towards those who were around him that were putting him on the cross? He prayed for them. So Jesus is an example. Now, working out our salvation. Working out our salvation is really an issue for us to trust and obey. Because there's no other way to trust and obey for us to be able to become mature in Christ. Now, hold on and hold out was our last point. Holding on to Jesus, holding on to his word, emulating him in our life, and then hold out. What does hold out mean? Hold out means we're holding out the word of God, the Bible. We hold it out for friends and family and other people. So we hold in and we hold on to Jesus and we hold out the word of God as we live our life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time together. And I pray, Father God, right now as a church that you really have spoken to us, that your word, Father, would be alive. And some of us, Lord, we do realize that we are in a time of confusion. And maybe we've allowed politics or, or problems or finances to overwhelm us. Lord, guide us, direct us. Show us the way. Lord, we want to be like you. We want to bring love. Lord, we want to direct people to God the Father through your sacrifice. So be with us now, Lord Jesus, as we take the time now to give you an offering from our heart as we sing to you. So we thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.